<laughs> and that, to some extent, uh, without me, none of this would have been necessary. So, uh, but I have, I have to do also pass the blame to my father. He's the one that really started this. And he planted the first chestnut trees that he planted at my home, which is a 15-minute drive west of here. He planted the first chestnut trees in 1957. And he also planted a lot of different kinds of nut trees just as a hobby. And over the years, it really didn't take very long, he said, oh, these chestnut trees are doing really well. And the walnuts and the hazels and all the almonds, every kind of nut that he, the other nuts that he planted were not doing as well. He planted almonds? We had it. We had. Wow. I we. I don't think they were really almonds because I remember eating them, and I think they were probably. Uh, they might have been sweet pitted apricots or something like that. Yeah, there's like this party almond thing. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it was a yeah, got, party almond. I've got one of those in my yard. <laughs> Whatever they were, they didn't last very long. I I can only remember eating nuts from them in one year. Uh, but. Anyway, sometime in the late 1960s, you know, he planted most of his trees, chestnut trees 1957, and then probably through 1965, planted all, a lot of Persian walnut trees and heart nuts and hazels and kind of everything that was a nut tree. And then he said, you know, we should have planted more chestnut trees. So in 1971, kind of at a time when land was still pretty cheap, we said, I want to buy a farm just to plant chestnuts on. So we bought the property, the 80 acres that we have back here. Uh, and then he and I collected seeds from the trees that were planted in 1957. Right. So the seeds from the 1957 trees got planted over here on the, on the new land in 1972. And uh, then I went away to college and, well, just shortening the story. Uh, while I was at college, I decided I want to come home and do this as a business in no small part because when I graduated with a PhD in forestry breeding in 1983, there were absolutely no jobs available at any university for that kind of thing. And in fact, for years after that, they, nobody was hiring tree breeders. So, so I got to do what I wanted to do, and I didn't have to worry about the fact that I really had no other choice. <laughs> and, and so I came home, and just kind of a sidebar, you know, my schooling is in tree breeding, and so whenever I, I see a problem, you know, the problem is solved by breeding. So, uh, <coughs> and interestingly enough, me working here with these trees has allowed me to do what I was trained to do better than if I had been at a university. Uh, but now the universities are starting to come around. And uh, the University of Missouri has just hired a fresh PhD as a chestnut breeder. He's got the job that I wanted to have 35 years ago. Uh, but I'm uh, working really closely with uh, Ron Revord at, in Missouri. Uh, in fact, we got trees tagged here that are in the database. So, so now I get to pass on kind of what I have done, and, and some other chestnut growers too. Uh, we've been working for the last 30 some years evaluating and selecting and actually done a pretty good job making improvements to the point that now chestnuts can be commercial. But we've got a long ways to go. There's a lot of improvement yet to do. Uh, and now that's going to happen on a much larger scale than it has happened to this point. So. When I look at what I'm doing now, I'm working for Amy and I'm working for Ron Revord. I, I'm employed by a lot of people. These people aren't working for me, I'm working for them. And that, that's the way it ought to be. <laughs> so, just to, I guess I gave you the, the history of how we got here. You know, this is just my dad's hobby that got out of control. Um, 
and really since 1994, that was the first year that somebody, a Korean wife and an American husband, like backed their truck up to my door and said, I'll take all you have. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, we had a little bit of trouble trying to sell chestnuts, and we were doing mostly wholesale. Uh, but ever since 1994, now that's quite a while ago, the demand for chestnuts has exceeded the supply in, in the U.S. by a lot. Uh, we keep thinking, now, oh, sometime that demand is going to be saturated, and it will be, but not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem close. That's where helping make products with is going to make the demand higher. Yeah, right. yeah so that yeah. you know that's why when everybody says to me, "Oh, we should be making chestnut flour," I said, "Well, first, let's try and fill the demand that we already have for the fresh nuts before we get too excited about flour." Yeah, because it's simpler. Uh, yeah, the, for for almost any tree crop, if the grower can sell it right to the consumer as it comes off the tree, that's the most profitable for the grower. There's one term that I really hate, and that's value added. You know, that's cost added. And, and it, it usually, for all, essentially all crops, the quote, the value added products don't put more money in the pocket of the grower. You know, if you think about wine, or even the tart cherry growers in Michigan, um, you know, the winemaker makes money, but the grape grower doesn't. Right. Uh, so, so that's why I have been kind of dragging my feet on the chestnut flower project. Uh, but now it, it's kind of like overwhelming, and I'm starting to catch on to the idea. Okay, well, if we want to plant chestnut orchards for flower. Then we're looking at 20 to 50 years from now. I have no idea what the economy or the economics of flour is going to be then, but I do know that if, if there's going to be a market for chestnut flour 25 or 30 years from now, well, we better get working on it now. <laughs> and so, so that's brought me around to the idea that, okay, well, let's, let's pursue flour as and I, I'd like to expand that to peeled products because it could be flour, it could be whole kernels, or it could Shucks. be it could be fermented products or, or whatever. Great. Uh, and I think even now there is a good market for fresh peeled kernels in the food service. So restaurants buy a few chestnuts, but they don't like to have to go to work to peel them. Things like a half an hour, an hour to peel a pound by hand. So w with this process, we can peel chestnuts before they're all the way dry, while they're still like soft and you can eat them like candy. And I did sell the peeled kernels like shortly after we made this machine, which incidentally was made with some uh, grant from USDA 1991, in case you want to know. Um, so after that, we were selling some to chefs, and uh, I got feedback from one chef who just he just ordered uh, 20 or 30 pounds of kernels. He was going to do a Thanksgiving dinner. And he wanted to make chestnut stuffing, and his only complaint was he says the kitchen help kept eating them. <laughs> because they're when they're uh, soft and fresh out of this. They're just like candy. Um, these hard ones that come out of here, you don't, you can't put in your mouth and eat. They're too hard. Uh, so anyway, that's another market that nobody's talking about now. But I think that's a market we could do right now. The downside being the shelf life of those fresh peeled kernels is two weeks at most, and that's in the refrigerator. Yeah. And you got to know four weeks ahead of time that you need them because it. Before they go into that hopper, the kind of the drying process that they go through is the most important step. And so if I'm going to sell a thousand pounds of fresh kernels today, I had to start that process four weeks ago. And two weeks from today, they're all bad. And so 
that's why we haven't pursued that because uh, there's not enough demand and we really need a better system for staging uh, yeah. that product and saying, okay, if you want them, you got to tell me four weeks ahead of time so we can get them dried properly and then peeled and then shipped. Um, Do you think if that, if that system were in place, that that is your best market for, I mean, like the most valuable to you? I, at least I think, cost and the yeah, value I add? Think, <laughs> I think the, you know, the high end, uh, you know, high end food service. That's kind of a, you know, gourmet market that you can charge a lot of money. You know, mm -hmm. we could charge 12 or $15 a pound or more maybe mm -hmm. for that. Uh, whereas the processed products, once you make it into flour, then you're competing with all other kinds of flour. Right. And it takes three pounds of fresh chestnuts to make one pound of flour. Right. By the time you take the water out and take the shells off and a few culls, it's about three to one. So if, if we're selling fresh chestnuts at 450 a pound, uh, then that instantly makes the cost of flour, you know, at least fifteen dollars a pound. Right. And and that's without doing anything to them, without right. drying them and peeling them and bagging them. Right. So so that's that the, doesn't include labor is what you're right. saying. Yeah, right. the, yeah. The, the process of peeling and making flour. So, so that's the reason that I'm not too excited about flour, but, but for the other reasons, the fact that we're looking decades into the future, um, then we better start working on it now. And, and I, wanted, I wanted to point out, we've got a research project going on. A guy in Vermont is all, you know, it seemed like people Amy's age are the ones who were all really, really interested in flour. And uh, so there's a guy actually got a grant from the Northern Nut Growers to study the genetic variation and how well different chestnut trees make flower. Uh, he got the grant, but he's contracted us to do the work. <laughs> and, uh, so we have chosen some different species and different hybrids to try and represent kind of a broad genetic background and a broad nut size. So we've got 10 different cultivars or 10 different trees from which we are collecting samples. And for this study, we're taking them straight off the tree, immediately put it in the dryer, and we're either drying it at 20 degrees C, like at room temperature, or 35 C, which is kind of the maximum you can dry them at. That's about like 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the maximum you can dry chestnuts without making them taste bad. So we're kind of doing it at like like the low temperature, kind of like what's going on on the porch, versus a, a, an elevated temperature. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to see how fast they dry, how well they peel, and look at the and and then different levels of roasting, and then examine the quality of the flour that comes from those ten different trees. So this is the first time I think anywhere in the U.S. anyone has looked at the genetic variation among different trees in terms of their ability to make flour. Uh, and so how fast they dry, how many coals we have to pick out of the peeler, these are the things I think are important. Uh, you know, maybe more so than just the inherent flower quality. Um, but another lucky thing is that one of the guys, one of the PhDs working with Ron Revord in Missouri, uh, who uh, on the chestnut project there, he is trained as a wheat breeder. And what he did for his PhD was a look at different wheat cultivars for their flour, for their milling and baking qualities. So he's like already knows all the things to do to look at do you know who that is? Uh, Nick Meyer. Okay. Okay. Um, he's a young guy. Okay. But uh, he like was in an agronomic crop, maybe like a lot of people in this room, and thought, you know, we really ought to be growing perennial crops instead of annual crops. And so he kind of jumped ship from from the from the wheat and said, I want to work on chestnuts. And uh, 
he's coming here next week to put some permanent tags on the trees that are in our plant breeding database. So, so kind of as a maybe a branch of the breeding program will be flower quality. Hmm. Interesting. If you have the um, the dehydrated uh, whole kernels like that, can you rehydrate them slightly yeah. to get a similar quality to those fresh, slightly dry chestnuts that you mentioned that you, uh, that you sold to the restaurateur? Not, no, not really. You can rehydrate them, but they're like they're a lot like dry beans. You know, mm. you can't get a bean half rehydrated because mm. it's fully hydrated on the outside and it's fully dehydrated on the inside. Mm. So it's either got to be fully hydrated, and you can do that. So you can reconstitute these. Mm -hmm. And uh, the downside of that is you put them under water, and then they, they double, the kernels double in size when they take up water. Mm -hmm. But that liquid that's around them is then just, because the, the kernels are like 25 to 30 percent sugar. So when you put them in water, that sugar dissolves in the water. The last thing you want to do is pour that water off. That's that's the sweet, <coughs> syrupy stuff that's around it. So that's a difference between dried beans, which you could pour the water off and not lose much. Mm -hmm. So you want to, whatever you cook with those rehydrated kernels, you want to keep the water with it. Have you, have you like, tested, like, what the percentage of sugar in that water is? Could you theoretically use that water to make, like, chestnut syrup? I think you could. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, you know, it would depend how much water and how much you cooked. If you could, depending on how you handle them, you could get more or less. Yeah. But not less enough to pour it off. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's not just sugar. There are other yeah. flavors in there too. I think, I think part of the reason that Chinese chestnuts taste so good, they have sweetness enhancers which we haven't characterized yet, but I'm thinking things like vanilla, you know, that really make it taste good. Uh, and those end up in the water, too. So, uh, so if you're going to make, like we have done, you know, made chestnut stuffing with the dried kernels, rehydrate, then you just put water and all, and it soaks into the bread, and it's really good. Uh, I think something like chestnut stuffing made from dried kernels is as good as making it out of fresh chestnuts. So that two-week shelf life that you have, what could that be frozen? Yeah, so one guy we were working with did freeze them, and he said it worked. Yeah. And it only works because there's so much sugar in there, they don't really freeze. Right. So the sugar that's in the nut, both in nature and in cooking, acts as an antifreeze. Yeah. So I think you can take those partially dry kernels and freeze them and maybe extend the shelf life. So yeah, there's work that can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, one avenue we did pursue was putting preservatives, um, you know, like uh, sodium benzoate. And that just made it worse. Anytime you, put, anytime you put water on something, even if it's got a preservative in, and you got a wet surface on the kernel, then you got mold. And so that, that didn't work. And I'm yeah. sort of glad I don't want to put chemicals in it anyway, because people, right. people like these things because they don't have chemicals in it. Yeah. And so I think there are ways, you know, managing the moisture through temperature. Um, you know, you heat, around here, what we do, we heat things up and we cool things down. You know, that's, that's kind of what you do at a food processing facility. And so I think with inputs like that, either freezing or refrigerating or drying, uh, we should be able to manage that product. Kind of one of the big technical issues, I'm sort of airing my laundry now, but the hardest part of this process or of keeping the kernels is that each chestnut kernel dries at a different rate. And so when the average moisture content is, say, 20 percent, when they come off the tree, they're 50 percent. And when they're dry enough, they're like 10%. So that between the 50 and the 10, if you get it at, say, 25 or 30, which is the good for the fresh kernel, some of those are hardly dried at all, and some are all the way dry. And so that's, 
one of the reasons it takes a long time, if you dry them very slowly, then they stay more uniform in their moisture content. Or if you dry them rapidly, uh, then you've got different kernels at all different moisture contents and all different sugar contents. And so it's hard to do quality control. <clears throat> so, yeah, there are a lot of products we can make, but we need it really needs to be quite a bit of work on finding the optimum way to get there. You know, every time I eat a banana or drink milk, I think here's two things that are like really perishable, you know, but we figured out how to do it and it's real cheap. Mm -hmm. So it, it, these things that are difficult to handle can be handled, it's just we have to learn how. And also the scale. I mean, milk and bananas are cheap because of the economy of scale. And your chestnut farm is a bad economy of scale, and you know, which isn't a bad thing, but that's that's your obstacle. That, Running a mill, I know all about yeah. this. You know, like yeah. economy of scale. That's every that's day. a really good point. You know, the reason we have a co-op, why we have five growers, and we'll probably have more, is because having a facility like this that handles the production from a lot of growers we can take advantage of that economy of scale. Exactly. And, and it, it, the growers make more money when they work together than if they all work on their own. Uh, buy a lot. Uh, and so, for example, if you wanted to plant five acres of chestnuts, and then you say, oh, I need a cooler, uh, you know, I need yeah. all these facilities, you, it would be impossible. But if you have five acres of chestnuts and the co-op takes them, then you're, you don't have to worry about storing them, processing them, or selling them. A lot of people who grow things don't want to have to deal with customers. So, uh, <laughs> so do your members then basically just uh, drop off both bins on a weekly basis when the harvest comes, based, and then you will do all the sorting and stuff? So here? we've got like two different kinds of members, you know, Four of the members have contiguous property here, which was an accident of the coal mining company who planted the trees. And that's another whole story, but anyway, they, the trees that were planted here were planted by a mining company. Later that land was acquired by the current landowners. Uh, so we have three members of our co-op who've never planted a chestnut tree. And, and so we do the harvesting, <coughs> and the spraying kind of as the co-op does that for the grower. So that's a service that the co-op provides to the grower. And, uh, but the grower two hours north, he, do, he brings us chestnuts in bags ready to sell. Because mm -hmm. he has all that, he's got actually more acres than us other four members have combined. And so he already has the economy of scale, but he do not want to do online sales. So, uh, so he sells a lot of his crop because he's in northeast Ohio off his picnic table, because he's also a blueberry grower and a Christmas tree grower. And so he's used to selling things directly to people who are a half hour away, which is a lot of people. Uh, and he does chestnuts that way too. And he also does some wholesale, where somebody backs a truck up to his house. But whatever he has left over, he brings down here and we, we market it through our online store, or more and more we're doing some wholesale work. We used to do everything wholesale, we kind of shifted to almost everything online, and now we're expanding from online back to wholesale. And it's a different kind of wholesale. Um, we got people who, uh, they just buy produce, mainly it's fruits and vegetables and nuts. They buy it from the grower on behalf of, of their members who like have ordered it. So it's a little bit like Girl Scout cookies, whereas the members in this group say, I want 10 pounds or 20 pounds of chestnuts and you combine all those orders and then, then he comes here and buys them from us and distributes it to the, so it's not quite a wholesale retail like you normally think of. Um, and, 
and both of the new ones are both Chinese and they're by and for Chinese people and the Chinese people love chestnuts. China is the world's biggest producer, by the way. And what we're growing is Chinese chestnuts. So, so we're growing something that our customers are real familiar with. And they know more about them than I do. So I don't have to educate them on what to do with them. Uh, but once we want to expand beyond that, you know, people who move to this country and want to know where do you get chestnuts, uh, I think there's a big opportunity to sell to people who, you know, everybody knows the word, but not many people know what they taste like. Um, so we can go there too, you know, with the fresh sales. So between the existing demand, which is all recent immigrants, which still exceeds supply, we got a lot of ways to expand the demand beyond what we have now. But I'm not really pushing too hard on that because I don't want to disappoint any more customers than I already am. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more questions? So